Hey, I'm Randy Barkley and this is Jeremiah Lee and we're with Tricord Advisors. I know Randy and I are both certified financial planners so we, we do this type of stuff every day. I'm also a California licensed attorney and we, we work together. We work at Tricord Advisors and we, we walk clients through all sorts of things. And So we're going to keep our conversation going and we're going to talk about how to pick an advisor. Uh, I, I, this is near and dear to my heart of um, so many people want to work with advisors, so many people want to understand um, the, the dynamics of, of, of working with someone in finance or I mean any advisor really, but we're talking about a financial advisor and, and how do you do that? Uh, I have a number of questions I always encourage people to ask, whether it's of me or of others, um, but it, it's an important thing. And you've got, you've got a plethora of advertisements, I guess is the best way to say that, from whether it be television, um, you know, radio, where obviously it's a medium that we're in. Um, but in addition to that, you know, you can't open up a newspaper, you can't open a magazine without somebody telling you why you should choose them to provide you your financial advice. And and I think I think the distinction be in all advisors, of course, you know, we we always zero in on that terminology called fiduciary. Yeah. And, and you came to work for the firm because that was something that you felt not only comfortable with, but it was important that you were in a fiduciary relationship, right? Yeah, absolutely. My, my background being an attorney, um, you know, when we say fiduciary, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a higher standard. It, it's a, an extreme standard um, compared to a lot of other industries of, you know, I work in the best interest of my client, period. Um, you know, that's what we're looking for. And that's what's ingrained in us. And that's what our, what our liability even follows on. Um, there's, when I looked at moving over into kind of the financial planning and investment management field, there's a lot of roles that didn't seem um, acceptable to me in the sense I'd be in sales. You know, I'd, I'd be um, putting people in things that they maybe didn't fully understand or were just, that's how I got paid. You know, the more I put people in these products, the more I get paid. And in this role as an, an RAA, which is what we are, a registered investment advisor, we take on a fiduciary role. And even that it's, it's slightly different than an attorney fiduciary role but it's much closer to that fiduciary role of saying, I'm here in the client's best interest and trying to, as much as possible, take out any conflicts I might have that, that would lead them other than whatever is absolutely best for them. And I think, I think going back to when I first started in this business back in the early 80s, uh, you would introduce a particular investment to a client and the first thing you do is hand them a prospectus. And the prospectus was written by attorneys for attorneys. It's written in legalese. Uh, I, I became accustomed to how to sort through it and get to the essential parts of the prospectus. But the vast majority of the people, they said, this is kind of like buying a house. You know, you go through all this document, you know, and the, and the escrow officer is telling you to initial here and sign here. And you've got 50 pages of documents. But honestly, nobody reads it. I mean, nobody goes through and reads every single word. Now, you may because your background yeah. leads you into that into that knowledge. In fact, I, I know talking to you that you have seen in the documentation where things are not quite right. And you come back and say, no, this language is not right. We need to change it. But that but you have training. You have yeah. education and training in that area. But I find that my our the relationship now is that the clients rely upon us to sort through that information for them. And, and that they hire us to go through all that detail to make sure that the investment, uh, it meets their standards. It meets what they're trying to accomplish uh, for their financial life. Yep. Yep. We can do a quick intro. The, uh, this is, for anyone who does, this is uh, Randy Barkley and Jeremiah Lee. We uh, work together at Tricord Advisors. Randy and I are both certified financial planners, and I'm also a California licensed attorney. Uh, we help clients guide them through hard decisions. We guide them through life's curveballs. We try to help them make smart decisions with their money. And, and today we're talking about how to pick an advisor. How you know, to pick an advisor. It's really important. Yeah. So some of the first questions I always like to have people ask is, is kind of the, just what we're talking about, the, the fiduciary side of understanding what their role is to the advisor. You right. know, is it someone who's selling a product? Like a lot of insurance um, agents their sales, I would say, you know, that that's generally their role is they're selling insurance. Whereas when you get to financial planning and investment management, some of it's sales, some of it crosses over into advice to say, I'm well, here to public, advise you. The public doesn't realize that there's certain designations. Uh, there's testing and requirements that you go through in order to either have like, like, for example, just selling insurance. If you're, if you're selling annuities or life insurance, you ho you have to hold an insurance license that requires you to go through a test and you have to pass the test but then there is ongoing continual education requirements in order for you to maintain that that license 
Now, I'm an insurance, I, I'm licensed insurance because I've had it since, you know, frankly, back in the 70s. Yeah. You don't hold an insurance license because it's not part of what you do. I, I still hold on to it because there are some things that we still do with long-term care, life insurance, some of those things that it is easier for me to provide service to the clients because I hold that license. Yep, that's um, right. Yeah, anyway. But the primary role is is what we both have is a certified financial planner. It's a, a CFP designation. And that's a, you know, a, a, a slew of classes and training. It's an exam and it's... Except for the board. The board, I, I think you need to emphasize, the board is not just a a simple sit down, you know, fill in the blank, so to speak. It, it is a pretty, it's a pretty complex, yeah. it, it takes a lot of preparation for it. And the failure rate for CFP exams is about 50%. Mm. So um, I can remember standing in line to take my, to sit for my boards. I was up at the University of uh, USC, I was up at the University of Southern California. And the lady, the gal who was standing in front of me, she was an attorney. And she told me this was her third attempt at passing the the board. And I looked, I looked at her and I went, I, I said, I'm in trouble. Yeah. Right. You know, because I, yeah, I just assumed she was smarter than me. Yeah. Fortunately, I got through it on the first try, but it wasn't something I took lightly. No, it's a, it's it's a lot a, of yeah. information. So a lot of that thing is understanding what the advisor has. You know, some just have a bachelor's, some have some securities regulation of, of kind of what their training is. The second I, I think is important for people to talk about is in the investment process. You know, some firms and advisors just put you in a fund. And that's it. They let it go. Others are, um, they're traders. They, they like trading. They want to be in the midst of it. And we talked a few episodes ago, a, a few shows ago of what, what's better, passive investment or active management. You know, the, the jury's out at times. Uh, generally, passive investments have outperformed um, the active ones. Um, so maybe just passive is fine, but it's important to understand. Well, it depends on your advisor. age and your circumstance. I think we came to that conclusion. You know, if you're 20, that's, right. that's different than if you're 65. Right? Yeah, that's right. That's a good comment. Um, it depends a little bit on those items. But it's important to understand whatever advise, advisor you're talking to, you know, what what is their process? Do they have a process? What do they look at? What do they consider? Um, how do they stay up to date? What changes do they make? Um, the second one, and to us, this is the central what we do, is the planning. You know, what are they going to do as far as understanding your life? understanding what makes sense for you. Like we, we, and I'm sure there's other planners who do this as well, but I don't want to make any investments for anybody until I understand their life. What do they need? Where are they headed? What's, you know, the industry we always talk about, what's the time horizon? What's their risk profile? I've had zero clients walk in and and be able to tell me, you know, those inputs. Here's my time horizon as a number. Here's my risk profile as a standard deviation of the portfolio. Like, you know, people aren't thinking like that. They're relying on us to advise them on that. And as we talk through, okay, are you going to have to pay for college? Um, what savings do you have for that? When do you retire? What pensions do you have in retire? You know, we can develop, okay, what their time horizon is going to be. Because it's very seldom that people need zero money, zero money, zero money, all the money. But in textbooks, that's, that's what you get. <laughs> it says you have a three-year horizon as if you need all the money in three years. When the reality, people are able to save and invest, and then they start needing bits and pieces and some of, and you know, they need to live off of it. And you know, developing that. So for us, we do the planning first. We understand a life. We understand what they need. And then the investments come second to say, what investments are going to fit with your life to help you hit your goals? And I don't think we're, you know, hugely unique in that. But I do think our emphasis on doing good planning first is unique. I think it's, that yeah. we spend a lot of time getting to know our clients. Because I've told a number of clients that were, you know, new and kind of interviewing us and we're interviewing them is, I'm not interested in a, a, a one-time nice to meet you, give us the money. Like we're looking for long-term relationships where the value that we add to people and the, the whole reason I think people um, are pleased with our firm is when we are having a long-term relationship, we're advising them on um, everything that happens in their life, you know, death of a spouse, um, what's going to happen with their kids, paying for college, retirement, making that choice to change jobs, all those items, we want to walk said, shoulder to shoulder. You just had an experience with a, a client, not what didn't happen directly to them, but it happened to somebody they were related to. That um, I had some comments from from somebody says, "Can you believe they just hadn't done any planning?" Yeah, and it was a sudden event, right? Yeah, it was a sudden unexpected death, and it you know I, I, I cross over back and forth between the financial side and the estate planning side. You know, we we do both, and I'm wearing both hats at times, um, but it it just becomes a little bit of a mess to un untangle somebody's life because we all have lives and you know nothing's sure. vanilla nothing's easy it has all these other aspects to it and to untangle someone else's life and find out where the accounts are who is the authority to sign something 
And when you have a trust, when you have a plan, it, it's a lot easier for the next generation to, to pick things up. But when you don't, it, it, it's just a headache. And the, the client that we're dealing with, they're in the midst of this headache for the parent generation. And, you know, no one expects to die. No one expects you know this stuff to be. This sudden. happened suddenly. I mean, this yeah. was a this was a sudden death. Yeah, a freak accident. It, it was. It wasn't. It wasn't as though he had some chronic disease or illness that you could kind of prepare for the end, so to speak. This happened instantly. Instant. Well, that, that's in contrast to you know a few years ago we had another client who had been a client of ours for a long time. They had their life organized, and the husband passed away, and the, the spouse was was left, and with kind of going through it, it she was fine you know there there was we knew everything was everything was organized there was you know appropriate life insurance there's appropriate um transition plans you know she was able to sign for things so when when they called in we could we could mourn with them and deal with that loss and say you're going to be fine like the financial side this is okay and then right. move directly into dealing with the emotions of it and help and supporting them and it's such a different position, and that all has to do with planning. You know, they knew where they were headed. They knew the safeguards that were needed. Um, that's a big piece. So I guess another one when you think about the planning is is fees. And I bring this up every meeting if the client doesn't, and I think everyone should understand um, almost to the penny of what they're paying an advisor. You know, it, it, are they are they paid a commission? Are they yeah, I mean, we've had we've anything? had people go through the initial. Yeah, we've gone through the initial interview, and people. We're asking questions. We're going back and forth. And I said, you haven't asked me the most critical question that you need to ask me. And they'll look at me and they'll kind of look at each other and they'll go, what, what's the question? I said, how much, how much am I going to charge you for all this? Yeah. You know, and I think it's important that you know that, right? Right. And there's different structures. Like so we pe people who will go into like mutual funds through, you know, Merrill Lynch or some of these other bigger wirehouses, you know, they're getting an expense ratio as part of the fund they're in. They're getting some sort of a commission that the the broker is getting when they you know put them in the fund. Uh, you know, some people understand that really well. Others, they've brought us their statements, and it's it's hard for us to figure out to say what you know what exact dollar amount did they get off of this, or are they being paid? Mm -hmm. So we work really hard to pull out our fees and to say, okay, this is how we're going to invest the money. This is the services we provide, and this is what that costs. And our clients are very happy to pay it. I have no you know shame or fear about our fees, but I think it's really important that someone understand it going in because it's not a flat fee. It's not a fixed amount. It, it's, it's relative to what we're doing and the services we're providing. And I think someone needs to really understand what that's going to look like um, going forward. And it, it's a tricky industry. And I think the comment about, you know, just being a financial planner, but we, we transitioned several years ago into what we call wealth management. And wealth management includes not only financial planning, in other words, the investment side of it, I should say that part of it, but we also like, for example, with your uh, coming into the company, Jeremiah, you provide the estate planning, and it's not that you try to garner everybody that comes in the door as a client and say you're going to become my client for estate planning needs, but you're here to oversee that, so you can either work with the attorney they're working with. In fact, some cases the clients are out of state, yeah. and you can't you can't do the legal work uh, for somebody who lives in Texas, for example. That's right. But I, I remember one case where you walked through with an attorney and there was a discussion back and forth with you about how the beneficiary designation should be set up within the trust, right? Yep. Yeah. I, I mean, the nice part is I speak attorney, right? <laughs> you know, I speak it, attorney. Uh, it's almost like a, a translator because, yeah, in Texas, you know, the way the laws work, you can only you know, practice law in the state in which you're licensed. And I'm licensed in California. And so someone in Texas, I, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to you know, try and draft their estate planning. But we ran into a, a, a situation where they were the, the attorneys in Texas were drafting and instructing us as the financial folks to label some of the accounts, in my mind, wrong, you know, different than what it should be. So we just hopped on the phone call and discussed it with them. And you know, I was able to learn a little bit about Texas law, that the way they do things is different. And it made perfect sense. But the client you know, was initially caught in the middle. But I said, you know, rather than this go back and forth and them try to be in the midst, I'm just going to, you know, can I just call them? And it, it was an easy conversation. And I think there's a, a benefit with, you know, partly the fees, partly the structure. But like you said, with when you get into wealth management, it's becoming more and more holistic to say, I'm not here just to do my job, this one little piece. I'm here to help you with your life. And we have a, a skill set, you know, for different advisors and different abilities. And we want to bring all that to bear for our clients and, and just help them. And like I said, I don't, I don't think we're, you know, this is a commercial, we're not hugely unique in that. But I do think it's important to find an advisor that has that perspective. You know, that you know, they're not example, just, you know, find yeah, find out piece. So I, I want to kind of emphasize uh, Chris Marsh because he's one. If you go on our website, tricordadv.com, you'll see four principles. And one of those principles is Chris Marsh. Now, Chris, 
Uh, his primary task is to oversee, he, he's basically manage the managers. We, we place money with, with different managers and we negotiate on behalf of our clients, but his job is to see, you know, to see what they're doing. And he compares their performances. We have a spreadsheet that is uh, massive that Chris has put together, but it shows all the different um, you know, performances and what they're in for, the asset flows. We're very big on the asset flows. And we're watching where the money goes and into different categories, what you know, bonds, but what kind of bonds into equities and what kind of sectors. And Chris has put all that together. And a lot of times our clients, they don't see any of that. But, yeah. but Chris spends every waking hour pretty much working on this stuff. So yeah. It's, it's, yeah, and then he, has, he wears a lot of hats. He's a huge asset to our firm. And it, that's an aspect right. that the, the clients receive the benefit of that. You know, right. They don't always see it. And if, if an advisor or if a new client you know, doesn't know to ask about that type of thing, you know, what is your process? How do you review these? They may not know if, if someone has someone like that in, in their office. And, and we do, and we're really uh, pleased with it. And part of that, I think, is, is kind of the last question I just want people to ask about is kind of the, the depth of the team and the, the ages of the team, um, kind of like what capabilities exist here. Like we have a number of clients who will have accounts and they need a line of credit. Well, we can set up a line of credit on their investment account so they don't we've have done, to sell we've assets. We've done that recently for several clients. Yeah, last few weeks. And it, it's, it's an asset it, or it's a, it's, an, it's a great ability that we have that, that people don't realize that that's set up. And a lot of banks will do this as well. You know, Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, they'll have that structure in place. But, but age is the other big one that goes with that. You know, who do you have? What can they do? But then also, how, what are their ages? You know, if you're picking up an advisor who's 75 and you're in your mid-50s, um, you got to think about that. Is, is this the person that I'm going to retire with? Are they going right. to be here when I do retirement? And our structure, you know, y- you have some more experience than I do, and and I will be here, you know, for, for, for forever. You know, uh, but, but I think it's also of. important not only the fact that you have uh, you've come into the firm and you're younger than I am, obviously. Uh, if people are watching on YouTube, you can see that there's a difference in age between myself and Jeremiah. But also, we're going to be adding additional. Uh, people within the next couple of years that are also going to be younger and that's part of our succession but the requirements on those people is that they have to have they have to be degreed and they have to be certified and they'll have some kind of specialty in some area that would help to build that teamwork to work with that client you know yeah, that's right we all bring different things to the table and I've had a number of clients we sit down with and they say okay well especially with estate planning well what happens when when I do pass away and I say, your, your, your heirs, you know, your, your, your kids, they just give me a call. And if we meet each other before then, all the better. You know, I love it when right. we have a, a running family generational relationship. But, you know, same with when people retire, same with all of our clients. If they you know, were to pass away, like we're here and we, will, we endeavor to continue to be here. And I think that's a huge aspect of um, we've had a number of clients that we've taken on um, just because their advisors retired and their yeah. advisors got older and the client is still mid-career. And they have to kind of reshop that. So I think that's a big, a big piece. And not that I say you can't change advisors and do things differently, but it is a, a thing to consider kind of as you as you go through. Um, yeah, if, working with somebody that knows you f- over the last twenty years, and you want somebody to carry you into the next twenty years or thirty years, and it may not necessarily be that particular person, but it will be that particular team. And that's what we've endeavored to do: is to have a continuity of our relationship with our clients going forward. And it's, it's extremely um, gratifying to me that I'm now working with people that are really in the third generation. I'm now working with grandchildren of clients that I started working with back in the late 70s and early 80s. But at the same point in time, I do feel like I have a responsibility to have that continuity yeah. for that family going forward. And so just being by myself, that would not have been uh, proper uh, as far as establish, keep maintaining that relationship going forward. Now I yeah. feel very comfortable in that with you as well as other people that are younger that are in the firm. Yeah, well, it's a good comment to some of these larger companies. You know, um, I picked on Merrill Lynch today, but you know, Edward Jones, the other ones. You know, as people get older, there's a number of times when people will retire, and those accounts just become corporate accounts. And so you know, they'll find you a new advisor, but they don't. There's not a transition to someone who knows you. It's it's right. just a handoff. And you know, we're trying to build, um, and a number of small advisors build that as well, to say, okay, we want this to be a, a, a steady progression. If you want to know more, you can go to our website. It's retirementunlimited.com, or you can give our office a call. It's 951-684-7011.